So what does breathing have to do with neck pain, back pain, anxiety, depression, physical fatigue? And how is it that breathing better can help where medications, therapies, and different types of exercise might fall short? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. My name is David Deppler from Breathe Your Truth, a project dedicated to helping people explore the breath to make life better. We know that big deep breaths is not the answer. And in fact, for many people, taking big deep breaths will actually make things worse. Dysfunctional breathing affects many systems of the body. It changes our cognitive function, decreasing short-term memory, making it harder to concentrate and decreasing our ability to problem solve. It changes the nervous system, often resulting in elevated anxiety. It changes cardiac function, can increase our heart rate, increase our blood pressure. It changes the digestive system by causing acid reflux and changing the way our intestines absorb nutrients. It can change our musculoskeletal system, actually leaving us with tight muscles on the surface and weak or kind of quiet core muscles. It affects our circulatory system, often resulting in cold hands and feet. Now, if this list feels all inclusive, you get the point. Dysfunctional breathing can influence every system in the body. Now, we don't claim that breathing better will fix everything, but it can be a really powerful way to get the ball rolling in the right direction. Some of you have likely come in contact with breathing practices like Wim Hof, Sudarshan Kriya, Tumo breathing, or any other practice that uses intentional hyperventilation as a way to do breath work. I've trained in many of these practices, and I like them in the right context. We've seen many people backslide in their baseline breathing by getting into these practices too soon. It turns out it's all about finding the right place to start. One tool to help us understand the right place to start is the Nijmegen. Now, this is a questionnaire that's not the end-all be-all, but it can shed a little bit of light on that best entry point into doing breath work. So pause the video now, complete this quick survey, get your score, and then come on back and we'll tell you what that means. So if you scored greater than 19, there's a good chance you have some dysfunctional habits around breathing that you may not even know about. Don't worry, you're in good company. There's a lot of you out there with a score greater than 19, and we've got some things that'll help. If you scored less than 19, research shows you're not completely off the hook yet, but you do at least have this test going for you. Stay with us as well, we'll have some things for you. Like I said, there is no one questionnaire or one test that gives us all the information we need on how people are breathing. There are five self-administered tests that we advocated, Breathe Your Truth. We explain these all in the next course called Your Breath, Your Truth. But for now, let's get into understanding how the breath works and how it is so closely related to how we feel. When we look at the breath, we recognize three dimensions the biomechanical aspect of breathing, the biochemical aspect of breathing, and the psychophysiological dimension of breathing. In the biomechanical aspect of breathing, there are three things we pay attention to. One is just how we stack up. So in general, to be able to breathe well, we should be comfortably upright. Okay, That doesn't mean rigidly upright, nor does it mean slumped forward. As we're comfortably upright, we can look at the next one, which is a good breath is not just a belly breath. It actually includes lateral movement of the ribs. So you can feel this. If you place your hands on your lower ribs, taking a breath in, you should feel those lower ribs come out and come back with the breath out. So a breath in, those ribs expand, and as you breathe out, they return. If you can feel that movement, it's likely you're using your full diaphragm at least right now. The third, the last part, is that our breathing should be in and out through the nose. And not just at rest, but during light, moderate, and even most heavy activity. Now, tolerance to nose breathing, especially during heavy activity, is something that you develop. Most of us, if we haven't been doing it, will feel very uncomfortable to do it. So you step in it in gradual ways to build that tolerance up. Huge benefits to being able to stay in nose breathing. Nose breathing humidifies and filters the air, so it cleans it. 
it brings an incredibly valuable compound called nitric oxide into the lungs. So nitric oxide produced in our nasal passages primarily, when we breathe, carries it into the lungs. That's how it gets into our body. As it enters the lungs, it helps oxygen get into the bloodstream. It's also an enormous boost to our immune system. It's an antibacterial, it's an antioxidant, it's an antiviral. So in these times of COVID, it's an incredibly valuable thing to do to keep yourself safe. Nose breathing. Nasal breathing also helps slow our breath rate and decrease the amount of air we move per minute, which turns out to have some pretty important health and training effects that we'll get to soon. Lastly about nasal breathing is it adds resistance to the air in a way that helps the diaphragm function better. When the diaphragm functions better, some cool things happen. Now, we think of the diaphragm as our breathing muscle, and that is true, but it does even more than that. The diaphragm helps us with spine stability and movement patterns. So the diaphragm helps us regulate pressure in the chest and our abdomen, or intrathoracic pressure and intra-abdominal pressure. By regulating pressure in those two chambers, it helps us be a lot smarter about how we hold ourselves and how we move. The diaphragm also helps bring blood up from the lower extremities back to the heart. The diaphragm helps stop acid reflux. It helps move the contents of our bowels through the intestines. And the diaphragm helps regulate our emotional system because of its influence on the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, as it turns out, runs right through the diaphragm. The vagus nerve is a large part of our fight or flight or our feelings of being content and peaceful. Okay, so by now you're probably thinking if we look at the biomechanical aspect of breathing, the more we breathe, the more we use our diaphragm, the better. It sort of looks like that when we just look at that dimension. But when we look at the biochemical aspect of breathing, things start to look a little different. All right, this is fascinating. So the biochemical aspect of breathing, here we recognize that as we take a breath in, we bring oxygen into the lungs and we breathe carbon dioxide out. When we bring that oxygen into the lungs, it gets into the bloodstream. Now how it gets into the bloodstream is a protein called hemoglobin binds that oxygen and carries it around. Well, it turns out that hemoglobin, this carrier of oxygen, is very fussy about when it lets oxygen go. In other words, it just doesn't let it go for no reason. What determines if it lets it go is the pH of the blood or the acid-base balance of the blood. The acid-base balance of the blood is determined primarily by carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is primarily determined by, get this, how we breathe. So how we breathe has a direct impact on the pH of the blood, which determines hemoglobin's willingness to let go of oxygen or not. And so the end story is you can have a lot of oxygen in the system because you've been taking good breaths, but if the pH of the blood isn't just right, hemoglobin will have a tougher time letting go of that, and you can actually end up with an oxygen deprivation later on down the road. Okay, So we, we see this point in the, let's say, the practice of taking big, deep breaths. If I were to ask you to take 10 really big, deep breaths right now, what would happen is you would blow off your carbon dioxide. In other words, you'd be breathing more than what your metabolic demand is right now. So you're going to have a net drop in carbon dioxide. Turns out your oxygen levels won't change much because they sit right at about 97, 98%. Anyway, so oxygen stays about the same. Carbon dioxide drops. That changes the pH of the blood. Now hemoglobin binds that oxygen, doesn't let it go, and guess where you feel it first? Your brain, okay? That's what the dizziness is that we get with hyperventilation. It isn't that we've over-oxygenated the brain. It's that we've actually under-oxygenated the brain by breathing more than we needed. We dropped our carbon dioxide, hemoglobin binds oxygen tightly, doesn't let it go, and the cells downstream start feeling deprived of oxygen, even though there's a ton of it in the system. Okay, that's the fascinating part I was talking about. So we've come to a crucial part of this conversation. What do you think the most common breathing dysfunction is? Is it under breathing and not getting enough oxygen right at the front end? Or is it over breathing and not getting enough oxygen out of the blood into the cells?
Well, the answer is the most common breathing dysfunction is actually over breathing. Rakhamov, a Russian researcher and international Buteyko instructor, has compiled decades of medical information to show that over the last 70 years, we have doubled the amount of air we're moving per minute on an average, doubled it over what we actually need and what physiologically is healthy. And you now know more is not better. More recently, Dr. Kyle Kiesel from the University of Evansville showed that 60 to 80% of us are stuck in dysfunctional breathing. So the symptoms of overbreathing include things like a general feeling of unease, fatigue, headaches, tightness in the chest and neck, essentially tightness of muscles on the surface, whereas decrease of core stability or kind of a weakness deeper down in. It can be problems with digestion. It can be problems with memory, problems with concentration. It can even be decreased sexual function. So do any of these symptoms sound familiar? And again, we won't say that breathing better cures everything, but it can be a really powerful first step. So why do we overbreathe? One theory that makes the most sense is stress. And we're not talking about the big stressors in life, but when we're risking life and limb. It's more the chronic low-grade stress that just gnaws at us over time and gently elevates our breath rate, causing us to overbreathe. A 1991 study by Jacobson showed that stress has a higher correlation to dysfunctional breathing than actual breathing problems like COPD, emphysema, and asthma. If you're interested in measuring carbon dioxide levels in real time, we use some technology called the Capno Trainer that allows us to see what's actually happening with the CO2 levels during different practices so we can see what's working and what doesn't work. Now, while I completely appreciate having access to this technology, I have to also say it isn't always completely needed. The important thing is that we pull the wisdom that we learn from, and that's that most of us are well served to decrease the amount of air we're moving per minute many times during the day. It helps our chemistry. So we're getting closer to the whole story. Okay, right now, up to this point, we appreciate that the biomechanics of breathing tell us to breathe low and to breathe in through our nose. And the chemistry tells us to keep it subtle during rest. The psychophysiological dimension helps us get the full story. In this, we recognize that how we feel can determine how we breathe and how we breathe can determine how we feel. They work both directions. Now, ironically, I've just told you a story about the biochemistry of breathing that carries a message to breathe less. At least half of you feel some anxiety about that idea of breathing less. And a bigger chunk of you are going to feel the anxiety if you actually practice breathing less. If we hold true to the psychophysiological aspect of breathing, we're gonna recognize that the more you feel anxiety around it, the more it works against you. And so the trick is to do all these practices in a way that feels sweet. And that is the trick. This is interesting work. It's not easy work to understand how to use the psychology to leverage that for better breathing, but it's important so we don't wanna shy away from it. I'm gonna advocate a practice right now and invite you to sit back and listen to it. What I'm gonna do is put to words a story that all of us at any moment in time are capable of experiencing. That story is always playing, it's just if we can get access to the story. So I'll put it to words and ask you to just sit back, take the words in and feel what that is. So here's the story. I have equal awareness the front of my body, the sides, and the back. I am settled. I hold a gentle interest and connection to all I sense in my surroundings. Yet I'm not distracted or defined by them. I am content. I do not want I do not resist. I am. And again, the invitation right now 
It's just to check in and feel how that feels in the body and what that might do to the breath. Did it slow it down? Did it make it a little more subtle? Did it make it feel a little more sweet? And while this isn't the sense that we expect you to run around with all day, the more we touch this, the better it is for our breathing. So as we head to the finish line, I'd be remiss to not put breathing in perspective of the full four pillars four, that make good health. All right, breathing is one of them. Sleep is another, diet and exercise. When we talk about sleep, we recognize that breathing better during the day will eventually translate to breathing better at night, but it can take a while. So there's a couple things that you can do that'll speed that up. Number one, side sleeping and left side more than right side actually makes it easier for us to breathe. So as much as you can tolerate it, sleep on your side. The next one is stay in nose breathing during the night. And this can be tricky because we're not aware of when we come into mouth breathing and most of us do at night. We generally recommend people try taping their mouth closed. All right, now use a really nice tape like a dynamic tape or a skin tape or a coverall. Put it on the back of your hand first. That takes a layer of the adhesive off so you're not getting chapped lips when you put it on. And then gradually step into it. So wear it for an hour or two the first night and just add from there. It usually doesn't take more than a few nights to get used to it. Breather Truth has got a video on the website that shows how to cut the dynamic tape. It puts a hole in the center and that can make it even you know, easier and less threatening to tolerate. I recommend you take a look at that if you have some interest in that. We do not recommend that you use duct tape or packing tape. Guarantee even no good will come of that. Okay, so that's the sleep part. Stay on your side, breathe through your nose, and have good sleep hygiene. The diet part, we're going to take a really complicated subject and simplify it, and that's that we know from circadian biology that time-restricted eating has incredible long-term health benefits. So for most of us, that means eating within a 12-hour window of time or less on a regular basis, biased more towards the beginning part of the day than the latter part of the day. Eat whole foods, non-processed foods, local, eat a lot of plants, eat the rainbow. In terms of exercise, research shows light to moderate exercise coordinated with our circadian clock. So early morning, early evening has the best long-term impact on our health. So to summarize the breath part, the biomechanics of breathing help us understand the importance of a breath that's low and includes that rib expansion. We're breathing in and out through our nose. The biochemistry of breathing helps us appreciate the importance of that subtle, easy, light breath. And the psychophysiological dimension reinforces that how we feel matters. This is very valuable work. For many of us, it takes time to be patient. From here, we invite you to integrate this information into your daily life. So bring this information into the gym, into the yoga studio, standing in line at the grocery store, folding laundry, unloading the dishwasher, walking the dog. If you want to dig a little deeper, take the next course, Your Breath, Your Truth. And reach out if you have an interest in individual sessions where we use capnometry to actually see what's happening with carbon dioxide levels. Thank you for taking this learning step with Breathe Your Truth.
if u scored greater than if u scored greater than if u scored greater than